All right. So I'll, I'll fill in the space and, and uh, say what Nick was going to say. Um, I believe everybody's screen has our uh, um, announcements for the uh, agreements for engagement. Um, I don't need to read each one of those, um, except for the beautiful sound of, of young children in the background. We'd like you to mute your, your microphones, and particularly if you're a, a, an observer to this rather than a, rather than a presenter. Uh, there is a chat box in the lower right, and you can either direct your comments to everybody, or uh, if you pull down on the scroll down menu, you can direct your comments to individual speakers uh, or even others who are on and you just want to have a private conversation with them. Nobody else will see that. Uh, that chat box is the best tool that the moderators have for knowing what you're wondering about, any questions. So if you pop a question into the chat box, um, Nick or I will pick it up and, and then we'll squeeze it into the conversation. And we'd love to have your questions so that our presenters can guide their, their presentation to, to what you're, need, what you're needing. Um, the, the, then, are you with us again, Nick? No, not yet, okay. Uh, then I will say that um, this is um, our first run of 24 hours of PBL Plus. This comes out of our organization, pblplus.org. Uh, and we are already queuing up uh, our second one uh, for October. And we hope we'll see you all there. And yet you'll tell all your colleagues to come and join us as well. Um, I'm also expecting we're gonna ask a, a good number of our presenters uh, to come back and to report continued progress uh, on their PBL. Um, and then my other little advertorial is we are beta testing our student um, uh, access platform to access students to experts and work with each other. It's an internet-based tool, but we're looking for beta testers. So uh, those in our audience today, and, and, and I see a good number in our audience, are in large part experienced PBL educators. And we know that when we launch a beta testing in your schools, we're gonna have more articulate responses, great, greater depth of, of, of exploring the tool. So if you're interested in doing that, uh, pop us back an email. And yes, we are old fashioned enough to still be using emails, but pop us back an email. Nick, I think you have, everybody has Nick's email. Um, uh, many of you have my email, so we'll take it any way you, you want to send it to us. But we would, um, we'd love to have you uh, on board in continuing development of this, this work, which is just so important. Uh, so with okay, that- Can I, can I- Oh, you're back. Quick, I yeah. want to get out of share, share mode. So I, I want to just quickly run through the, the lineup here. Yep, you okay. got it. All right, so we're going to, we're going to probably mix and match this. It won't necessarily be sequential, but um, so we have um, uh, Weijing uh, Wu from uh, Elliott Innovation School, and she has a lovely story herself of having come from the high tech industry and saying, no, I think I have something to contribute to uh, education. And so uh, this is a school in downtown um, Boston, like looks at Bunker Hill. Um, and then we have um, a long-term uh, friend and collaborator of Frank and I, uh, Ella Ben Ur, um, who has developed this wonderful Innovators Compass. She works at Olin College, lots of other amazing things that she does, as well as helping facilitate the uh, program that Frank started at Harvard uh, Learning Environments for Tomorrow. And then uh, two long-term collaborators of Frank's up in Oxford Hills, um, Brewster Burns and um, Pete Tui, who have this really wonderful human X human. Uh, they'll they'll describe the right name of it, but it's a it's a PBL uh, humanities program that they've been running for a long time. So they have really a rich history with that. Um, and now I'm going to stop sharing so that um, we're not all looking at everything that's flowing through my um, screen. And I have this is the greatest number of participants we've had. Uh, so far, and that must mean that we're at a, a timely hour on the East Coast of the United States. Um, though I will remember to say good morning, good afternoon, good evening, um, buenos dias, buenas tardes, buenas noches. 
Mm -hmm. And um, Nick, I was going to give us more credit than that. I was going to say we're on a roll and we're slowly picking up. <laughs> How's that sound? So very good. Um, so um, I guess I want to start with um, Weijing just partially because we know that <laughs> uh, a child may come wandering into the screen at any moment. Um, <laughs> And uh, so let, let's uh, address that. But um, the, um, to me, what's interesting about Elliot is that, um, first of all, it's not a single school. There are three different buildings scattered around North Boston. And, um, and the building that was in the image there is this very new purposefully designed uh, facility. And the other schools are, you know, 150 year old uh, buildings that have been transformed. Uh, but there's a desire to have kind of continuity between those uh, schools. So if you could just tell us a little bit about what's happening there and what your role is in the in that school setting, um, because yeah. you're the you're the continuity <laughs> between the different yes. facilities. So we are, um, I think it was 12 years ago, uh, the school was one building with 150 kids, K to eight. And um, over time, Tracy, our, our, our executive director now has transitioned the school, it's grown. Um, and we are now in three buildings. We opened the third one just this September. Um, and we are up to 720 students, I think, and our enrollment's supposed to be close to 800 for next year. Um, and so one of the things that has been really, really important for us at the Elliott is really trying to maintain that small school culture because that is what made us successful is, is building the culture between the families, the teachers, the kids, and everyone having this, this sense of closeness. Um, but translate it to something that has kind of exploded in size and we're now in three buildings. Um, and so one of the things that we've kept um, in terms of our structure is having enrichment um, flow across all three buildings. So for example, we have one visual arts teacher that sees all the kids. Um, I'm the robotic specialist and I see all the kids. And that's one of the things that we, either the teacher moves or the kids move, but we try to make sure that that's that continuity and that we see the kids over and over again. So we've, we've had to do some creative scheduling. Um, we've had to, you know, we definitely have more enrichment. And so kids don't see the same enrichment all the time, but at least they get to see, they have that one teacher. And our, our mantra this year has been um, three buildings, one school, because that, that school culture is super important to us. So Nick, did you want me to talk about the project? Is that where we're going? Yeah, why don't you um, share, again, knowing that you, you might get disrupted. Um, yeah. Why don't you share um, some of the projects that you talked about? So as a K-8 yeah. school, um, yeah. you were talking about some of the projects that the eighth graders have been involved in, but have really kind of launched them into yeah. uh, a, a strong start to their high school experience. So, so one of the things that um, we do at school um, and to maintain this culture is we do something called buddy classrooms where an older classroom is paired with a younger classroom and they do things like read alouds together or we go ice skating together. Um, but what I, I really wanted to do with my class was to really push on those relationships and to, to grow them. And so uh, my eighth graders were actually paired with what we, uh, kindergarten for their buddy classrooms. And so um, I designed a project where uh, eighth graders would be responsible for uh, designing and creating an educational toy for a kindergarten customer. I mean, it's a familiar project, uh, toy making. Um, and one of the, the biggest things that we wanted to make sure was that they were designing for their audience. They were not designing in this hole. They were not saying, oh, this is what I think is really cool. Um, but really what what's going to suit the person that's sitting in front of them. Um, and so one of we start this project by saying you know what's the process because process over product has always been a really key factor in in what we're doing um and it's really hard for a 13 year old to say oh i want to think about the process versus 
let's make a toy car, <laughs> you know, and it's, so that was one of the, you know, the hurdles that we get to overcome was that I had a lot of kids that were really focused on what they wanted to make and not thinking about um, the process they were going through. And this was new to a lot of students. Um, the other thing in eighth grade that's very interesting at our school is because of the demographic um, in after sixth grade, a lot of our students, for example, this year, something like 80% of our students leave for the exam schools. So we get a very new population coming in in seventh grade. And so they haven't been, you know, what we call elitized. They, they haven't gone through this, this with us over and over again from kindergarten. I have kids, you know, in sixth grade that I've had since kindergarten. So they get it. They're like, oh, yeah, I know we, we're going to document the process. Sure. But in eighth grade's a little different. Um, and the middle school population is a little different, too. You know, so uh, we start the project by thinking about the process and then we go visit our customers. We we go into their space and we sit with kindergarten and they interview them. Um, and one of the things we do beforehand is like, how do you interview a kid? How do you, these are five-year-olds and they are going to not have a filter. They're going to say exactly what they think. Um, and you have to watch what you say because, you know, sarcasm is lost. You can't, can't do things like that. Um, so we do a lot of prep and then they go in and they interview and they collect data. You know, they bring it back, we analyze that data, they come up with proposals, they go back to kindergarten, they say, this is what we're thinking. Um, and sometimes they get really great feedback, sometimes they get feedback they don't want to hear. Um, I had a student come to me and said, oh, Ms. Wu, I don't know what I'm going to do because the kids hated my ideas. And I said, oh, I, I'm sure they didn't hate them. And she goes, no, they said, I hate those ideas. <laughs> <laughs> So it's finding this like balance when you manage the kids. And, um, you know, and the, the kindergarten teacher on the other end of it, I'm working with her and she's prepping her kids because she's pairing kids together that, you know, might be struggling with uh, verbal expression. They're talking about feedback. They're talking about how to um, respond. And so on her end, there's learning too. It's not just on our end. Um, and you know, this, this project comes together several times. They, you know, they go back, they prototype, they review, um, we meet up, and then we start to change spaces. So we say we go, we go over to their building, and then they come over to our building, and they get feedback, and at the end, there's a, a final, you know, toy showcase, and we invite other classes to come, and the kids play, and, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's about the project, but it's also about the culture building. Um, which it kind of has all these layers of, of what we're looking for at the Elliott. Mm -hmm. Good, good. Well, now I'm remembering why I had uh, Ella um, be a part of this session too, because uh, I, I remember after you and I talked, I thought, oh, I know somebody else who needs to be in this session and we'll, <laughs> we'll bring Ella in in a little bit. But I saw her smiling when you were talking about getting feedback that they didn't um, um, appreciate hearing and, and the growth that comes from from that type of thing. Um, the um, well, well, we'll we'll step to Ella. I, I do want to mention that um, Wei Jing and I are working on um, the Elliot uh, facility as being a potential host to a um, project-based learning experience that Frank started a decade ago. And um, we're, we're thinking of that as kind of the ideal environment because it, it already has this, you know, the range of kinds of uh, spaces uh, in a really great location <laughs> uh, being right on the harbor. Um, and so we're working out the details, but that's likely to be mid-October. So, um, Hey, Frank, let me jump in um, if, if I could, just as a real quick one. Uh, so, uh, uh, so a, a little more about Elliot. Um, those experiences sound really great. How much, what, what part of a student's school day is doing projects? Um, and, and, and then actually Brewster and, and, and Pete, you hold that question as well, so that when you get your, 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 your chance to talk, um, let's cover that as well, okay, with you guys. So yeah, what about Elliot? What's, what's the day in life of a student look like? Uh, okay, so this is very interesting because this is something that we are 
constantly trying to grow. Um, we started, you know, when we were traditional school, it was a very traditional school day. Kids have reading, writing, art, Mondays, music Tuesdays, you know, uh, gym Wednesdays and, and so forth. Um, we've shifted our schedule so that enrichment occurs in these 15 day blocks now. So they'll have say art for 15 days in a row for an hour a day, and then they'll switch to theater for 15 days. And what we found is this, this um, very technical change has allowed the uh, teachers to make the adaptive change of their curriculum into more project-based. Because now it's instead of I'm seeing a kid once a week and when they come back, they have no idea what we just did. You know, I have to spend the last first 10 minutes of the class period reminding them and recapping. So they're coming in every day and it's like, oh yeah, I'm just gonna pick up where I left off and move on. So that's one piece of the day. Every, every kid has this hour of enrichment. Additionally, we're an expand, expanded time school. So we have an extra hour a day of school. Um, uh, we have, I think, seven hours. So we have a block call we call Epic, which is Elliot Play, Innovate, and Create. And we just piloted this this year where it used to be, we used to use the extra time as intervention or enrichment, and that's what we called it. But now we wanted to really transition it to this um, time where students have more choice and voice in their learning and to have it be project-based. Um, in fact, in, in would be built out in a way, and we were in phase two. So phase one was specialists or enrichment teachers who are used to doing this project. Um, they would run an epic group. So students would, they, teachers would go to the different classrooms and they would pitch an idea. So for grades two through four, we had the STEM teacher come in and say, oh, I really wish this summer I was moving all these boxes and I, I really wish I had an elevator in the lower. So if you wanna come think about an elevator with Miss Hutto, you know, sign up for Miss Hutto. And then the theater teacher said, well, I really wish Harry Potter was a play. You know, these books are great, but I want it to be a play. If you want to think about this. And so then kids voted and they ranked and then they were put into these mixed age groups where they did these projects during Epic. Um, that was our first phase. And then it sort of transitioned in a really cool way um, in the middle of the year to this point where um, there were kids in third grade who were in a computer science group and they said, you know, I enjoy writing code, but I really feel like the school, we don't have a newspaper and I feel like there should be a way to distribute news in our school. Hmm. And so the kids uh, were told, they said, you know, if you really want a newspaper, you got to con convince Ms. Ms. Griffith, convince Principal Tracy. So they wrote an article to Principal Tracy saying why the school should have a newspaper. And then, a, you know, Principal Tracy said, find a teacher to help you. If you can find a teacher to take this on, they found a teacher and now we have a school newspaper. So this is how like the ethic block has kind of transitioned and we want to get to the point where um, kids are, are really starting to drive their own learning. Because the newspaper, for example, is really cool because now the teacher is infusing writing lessons into this project. Um, and so the idea is that right now we have dedicated two hours a day where kids are in these projects. I know it's a very long answer <laughs> to these project based um, arenas. Um, next, well, since we're not going back, the hope is through some professional development that all kids would be 100% engaged in at least several high quality project-based learning experiences throughout the year. And we wanna train all our teachers. So it's not like, if you really wanna do the project, you have to go to this teacher or you have to go to that teacher. Some, we're doing it in pockets, but we, we don't have the coherence and the consistency from K to eight. And that's really our next step. That's great. a great aspiration. Um, Nick, can I ask Brewster and, 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 and Pete to jump in? Um, and, and if that's okay with Ella, because I know you had, we're queuing her up, but this issue about duration uh, and, and integration of subject is exactly their bailiwick. Is that okay, Nick? Sure. 
Yeah. Oh, so, so guys, you gotta, you have to introduce yourselves. Uh, I'm Brewster Burns. Uh, we both Pete and I live up in the Oxford Hills in Maine. Um, Pete, go ahead. You have to Wait, wave. I'm, That's good, Pete. I'm Pete too. <laughs> <laughs> hey, back to you, bro. So Frank, what's the specific question? Well, um, uh, we, we, we just learned uh, about a phenomenal school that is in continuous development and they've got a strong PBL program. It's not universal, it's not everything, uh, but their goal is to ramp it up and have it be a, a, a defining a delivery for much, much more of school. Uh, your Humex program uh, that, and, and I know it has transformed, but uh, well, I'll, I'll just share with everybody, your, your Humex program integrated English, math, social studies, and sciences with four teachers and a group of about 100 students uh, in a high school level, high school, 10th grade, uh, doing projects for the entire uh, year. Uh, one, it, it was sequential projects. That's how I would best describe it. Um, and, and so that's a very different experience than most schools know. Uh, so if you could share a little bit about how that worked uh, and then uh, what, what positive impact it had and then what, what challenges that brought to you. Well, a couple okay. things first. If, if I answer that, we won't probably be able to get to the actual thing we're presenting. <laughs> <laughs> and to be honest, I mean, the, the quick answer to that is it waxes and wanes. You know, it, as anybody knows who works in public education, um, it, is, it is difficult uh, to sustain anything that is different because of the pressure to get back to uh, what people are used to. Um, Pete, Pete and I have been able to maintain what we do for 20 years now, uh, but I do want to stress, I mean, what we're presenting uh, was, a, was a big uh, a paradigm shift for us, and we think it's pretty important, and I'd rather present that than talk about that or answer that question. Okay. Well, so, well, so let's, <laughs> let's, let's bring um, Ella in for now, and knowing that you have partially answered that question, so we won't ask that other question again. Um, but um, Ella, um, I, I mentioned the many different things that you do, and I, I know you wanted to show a little video, and you wanted, uh, you know, you've got other things, but you, you take this moment and share kind of what your journey uh, through facilitating good design thinking, project-based learning, et cetera, has been, or whatever else you wanted to talk about. <laughs> sure, I mean, I think any order is great. Uh, I can, I could have easily gone last too. Um, I would love building other people's ideas. I did have something that I can show, um, and I'm happy to do that. Um, do you, did you want to do the two minute video? Yeah, you can share your, share your screen and show it. Because okay. I, frankly don't know where it is on my um, Okay, here we go. So this is just a brief introduction to, I guess, me and, and uh, Innovators Compass. Um, does that work? Do you have my screen? Yep. Can you hear it? You're going to have to turn the volume up. Designer, leader, coach, educator, and parent. And I've worked towards some common, usable, shareable language that gets us unstuck. That's come to five questions that move us forward when we see them in new ways. Who's involved? And together, what's happening and why? What matters most here? What ways are there to do this? And what's a step to try now and see what happens? These are our compass to explore all sides of any challenge, its present, future, details, and big picture to make it better naming it, say, our innovators compass, and naming these powerful views, they are key observations, principles, ideas, and experiments, helps us use them more. Different people and methods explore these questions in their own words and ways, but they all remind us to just ask these more often. What happens when you do in our homes, schools, companies? Just a tool for everyday work and content work in the classroom of solving problems but it is also being used as a tool for social and emotional learning. For me and our faculty, it just makes people think differently about a problem. They're realizing there are solutions and that everyone has a voice. 
we've used the in parent-teacher meetings. It's like a visual way of representing that we're on the same team. Client meeting is like where we need to brainstorm things. I saw much better results, having better ideas for the product, or better ideas to solve like a certain problem. I've used it in training volunteers with Core Africa. Learn and know much about how the problems are facing and how we can together with the community devise and get the solutions. I'll bring this home, literally. My own family has used this compass together to design new years and vacations, keep making those better, and tackle the steps that come up along the way. As small as, my Cheerios fell on the floor. Great observation. Got an idea? All the free resources on innovatorscompass.org are ideas people gave to make these five questions accessible for every person in the moment. These questions move our world forward. Please use and share them. And your stories move this work forward. So share those back by email or tweet. Go be an unsticker. <laughs> so could everybody see and hear that? Yeah. Let's see here. So um, I can share, you know, if you, so that was very broad, very simply put, my background uh, is also very broad, um, but just wanted to bring the best of a lot of different things together, uh, design thinking and many other things into something that could be used in many different settings, including schools where it is by far dominantly used. Um, and so I have some examples of <clears throat> project-based learning, but just wanted to, you know, sort of my point of view, I think about project-based learning in general and with Innovators Compass is that its greatest impact is when it spans, you know, just like Weijing just um, described, you know, from STEM to ELA to SEL, big stuff, small stuff that comes up um, and something that, you know, ports from school to after what happens afterwards. So um, I can share some some stories if that if you'd like of some actual yeah. well, projects. Uh, um, a, another video that, that's longer and we're not gonna have time for, but it's definitely no, worth it was pursuing Ella's um, presence in the in the web is um, a, a class that she's taught at, at um, Olin for a long time that connects uh, college engineers to um, elders in the community who are in need of um, some adaptive um, responses and it, 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 it's a very compelling video to tell that story but you you can fill in the details that I didn't yeah. oh do I, I I mean I can just in it so um, I mean I do have a video of that one project but um, I can share just much quicker I think if you want some different ones with some slides sure if you'd like, I can start with the one that you just described. Um, so that's my own work and it's here. Um, students go through a bunch of iterations with Innovators Compass answering a handful of driving questions. The first is who's our partner? They work with an older adult in the um, community and so they get to choose that person. So the first set of, you know, the first thing they're doing is out there kind of like, you know, agent described um, in the community, meeting lots of different community partners that they could possibly work with, older adults, um, understanding what's happening for them, what matters for them and why, and coming up with different ideas for different projects and then picking one, um, both a partner and a project. Um, and then going through four more iterations. Play, where they're just playing with parts of ideas um, you know, to see what might possibly work. Prototype is the first put together idea. Um, pilot is something that has to go be able to live in a person's house for a few days. And then, and obviously <laughs> there's much iteration along the way. And then the product is something that hopefully will serve them, you know, in their lives. So that is that one. And it starts in sort of a slower kind of design thinking kind of like really spend time and develop principles over time. And then this faster, those faster, quick play prototype pilot produce iterations more like, you know, startups would do, but we always encourage them to treat this not as a process, but a compass and to sort of, if you think exploring principles right now is what you need, go do that. If you just want to go make stuff, do that. Follow your own sort of compass. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that story. Yeah. Um, so I have, you know, as, and we can bounce back and forth, but just as a sense of the other kinds of things I have are some other design projects and in K-12. Um, actually, I should just do a quick build on this one just to say that in the spirit of sort of authentic um, presenting, they do share out four, to, 
first of all, informally in their own project spaces. Um, to this is my co-professor Katrin and a visitor from the national um, AARP. And then they have more formal presentations in our classroom um, with all of the older adults that present and then a final presentation um, as well. And they apply um, the compass for all levels of their experience, including their, their teamwork um, and how to make that better, right? Observations, how's it going? Principles, you know, okay, what matters most to us to be able to work together as a team? Um, and I, I included those just to say that, so the examples I have are about all of those things happening in, in K-12, um, more uses in, in social emotional learning, um, like to deal with some of the kinds of issues we're having right now, um, used in ELA for designing for book characters, things like that. So as they're in, of interest, I can show them. Yeah. Um, yeah, maybe as some questions come back, um, we'll, we'll touch that. What I appreciate about what you just shared, though, is um, that although it's a compass and it has quadrants and they have labels that you say, hey, if you need to go explore in this realm, you don't have to go through them in a sequence. You can jump across the compass. Um, you can mash up ideas from one to the next, et cetera, and break away from the traditional design thinking education, which is all about a six step linear process, uh, which virtually never happens. I, I love the little diagram you had that showed the, the total squiggles all over your compass um, as right. an example of that. So. Yes. Good. Um, do, do you wanna hit one more thing or should we let um, Pete and Brewster step in and then see, see where the four of you go? Yeah, let's have a free for all after Pete and Brewster. Okay, is that all right, Ella? Sure. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'd love to share some of those if they come up. It'd be great. Okay, we're on. Um, yeah. So uh, P Pete and I have been, uh, I've, I've been teaching for 30 years. Uh, Pete, Pete and I have been teaching together for 20 years. Um, and, you know, we got into uh, project-based learning and uh, I think I started by going, or I think both of us went to the uh, critical skills, uh, ANAC New England, stuff that was done about about 20 years ago and really got into that. But what we um, what we've experienced over the years is pretty consistent with what most teachers experience, which is we had good years and bad years. Um, and some sometimes uh, the techniques we used seemed to go perfectly well and it was a fantastic year and the kids were incredibly engaged and then other years it just seemed uh, it just seemed very difficult and that um, uh, that uh, continued uh, every, you know, every year going up and down until about five, five or six years ago um, when we, when we figured something out. And the thing we figured out, which is uh, incredibly obvious, but kids really can't work together in the classroom unless they feel safe in the classroom. Um, and that was um, really eye-opening when we figured it out. We had a particularly bad year um, I can't remember how long ago, six, seven years ago, Pete. Um, and we, we, yeah, you're, oh, you're Pete's muted. muted. Unmute, un un unmute Pete. Please unmute Pete. She's important. Anyway, so what we figured out that all kids have to feel safe in the classroom. It was, a, it was, a, it was a kind of a revelation. It was, um, and, and, you know, shame on us for not figuring this out earlier, but like, I mean, Brew and I, I don't know, call it like, trying to teach through like cult of personality, you know, the relationship between us and the students uh, was something that we spent a lot of time doing. And we never realized that that doesn't matter as much as we thought, but more so, especially in project-based learning, it's the relationship between the kids. If the kids trust and like each other, um, you can do a lot of great stuff. But if they only trust me and Brewster, projects are dead in the water. Like they don't, they don't want to work with people. And it's the same as adults. You guys are all on committees. You're in schools. You know groups of people that you trust and you feel safe around. And that gives you the ability to, you know, throw ideas out there that, you know, maybe sound kind of weird, but you said, you know, that this is a group you can talk to. And there's other groups of people where oh, you're not going to say anything because, you know, even though you're an adult, you don't know how it's going to be met with. Um, and we kind of had like that I don't know, light bulb moment of like, oh my God, so we don't really matter as much as we think we do. Uh, 
which was really, it hurt. <laughs> but it, uh, it also uh, kind of freed us up to start thinking in different ways about how we go about you know, setting up a classroom, especially, especially in relation to projects. This is sorry. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm having a light bulb moment too. Uh, so what you just put on the floor here is, and, and if we call that whole domain of what teachers work is, is classroom management. Um, the traditional approach to classroom management's focusing on the wrong things. I, yeah, I would oh, if, maybe a lot of right things. About, if you're really worried about your relationship with the students and not the students with each other, yeah, you are focusing on the wrong thing. Got it. Okay, so carry on. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so uh, it, just as a uh, an aside, I mean, this what we're talking about. It does feel like you're going to be giving up a lot of time, um, and you just got to get over that for the benefits that it gives you. Um, and you know, you you also have to be very explicit with kids. The stuff we're talking about, you can't roll this out in the background and just hope it's going to work. You have to tell kids that the most important thing in the classroom is that they like each other and trust each other and feel safe in the classroom. Um, and they have to know exactly why you're doing everything. Um, your learning targets around relationships have to be crystal clear, um, in, uh, incredibly public, um, and they have to know them and be able to articulate them. So, you know, the, so, the basic thesis. Yeah, go ahead, Pete. So I'll add uh, two, two years ago, we had a student teacher, a former student of ours that we had before we understood this. Uh, he came back and uh, he was there from the beginning of the year. And his question was like, when are you gonna teach history? When are you gonna teach English? Cause we spend I, 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 it's the first month almost building that capacity in the classroom. I mean, and there's this curriculum going on, but I mean, the stuff we're doing it's and it's it's always they have to uh, vocalize it why are we doing this we're trying to build a community in the classroom um and you know it's that whole idea of that they have to they have to be able to trust each other and work with each other i mean th and that that's kind of the that was the huge paradigm shift for us to to realize that kids are just like adults they got to feel safe with the group of people they're around or you're not going to get the results that you hope for. So what we're going to do here is just basically explain the practices that we use that, that build the community in the classroom. Um, and we're just going to, you know, we have three big ones and then we're going to talk about the benefits. So Pete, go ahead with the first one. Uh, so the, the first thing we did, and I'll give the shout out to uh, restorative justice. Um, we had a teacher bring it into our school um, about eight years ago or so. Um, and uh, it was actually, actually Brewster's son was uh, in a class of this teacher that brought it in and he kept talking about it. And this was at the same time that we had a class that literally hated each other. I mean, we couldn't get the projects we'd been running for years. We had to stop doing them. Uh, we do this really elaborate thing where we set up a mock economy in the classroom. I mean, it's, it goes on for days. Uh, it's takes, it's pretty, it's pretty wild. Um, and but the kids also have to like each other and they have to they have to trust us uh, and they have to trust each other and there was no trust and it was the only time well besides this year because of this thing um it's the only time in like 18 years we made the conscious decision not to run it and we realized that it was because of the kids just didn't trust or like each other uh, so I decided I teach psychology too. And I talked to the teacher and I said, well, I'm going to start doing this in my classroom. Um, and the idea was that this is where the big paradigm came was it wasn't my relationship with the kids. It was the kids relationship with each other. Um, that kids would have to learn to listen to each other. Um, kids would have to be thoughtful. Um, and that was kind of the start of it. So it's, you know, restorative practices, instead of doing it, you know, something happens afterwards, it's like building capacity at the beginning. Let's talk about the circle, Pete, how it works. Oh, you, you, yeah. You, you, I, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, assuming, I'm assuming most people have been familiar with it, a uh, circle every morning, kids get in a circle, there's a talking piece, uh, there's a silly question sometimes, sometimes a serious con question around content um, or what's going on in the world. Um, and the person that has the talking piece, they, they say which way they're going to pass to begin with, and the kid can either respond or um, pass. And the the learning goal behind this is is like I can listen to other people. 
um, that I can, uh, you know, speak when it's my time. I can listen to other people um, and I can, you know, get along, I guess. What else would you want and to add? Well, our, here's our talking piece. I actually brought it home because it's so important. It's Randall Cunningham, anybody that's a Philly fan. It just happened. We just have, it was in the classroom and we use it day we're, one. We're Patriots really. fans though. I, Patriots. Yeah. <laughs> Patriots. Anyway, yeah, I mean, these, these circles are very simple, um, but it, it, it is the most important thing we do where one kid gets to be Those listened time. to by 40 other kids um, every single morning and they are the most important person and everybody's listening to them and uh it it, it absolutely changes changes the classroom the next practice we use is uh and, and it's very simple too you've heard them before just seating charts um we have seating charts that we change every two weeks uh the idea that if you think kids can handle seating themselves look at a faculty meeting and notice how people sit in the exact same spot for 20, 30 years and never move. Uh, adults are not capable of making good decisions about who they sit with and talk to. <laughs> Pete sits up in the back, I sit in the front. But with kids, we have purposeful seating charts and they know it. We tell them we are, these are not uh, a control method. In fact, they don't control the classroom because by the end of the year, uh, they like each other so much and we can't control the classroom because they're t talking to each other. They actually like each other. So we change the seating charts every, you know, it's four kids sit together. Every couple of weeks, uh, they get changed. Um, and what goes along with the seating charts is they always do an activity. Um, sometimes it's simple, uh, like a rock, paper, scissors uh, tournament. Sometimes a little more complex, like an egg drop uh, uh, thing where they have to make an egg drop uh, container that the egg won't break. Sometimes they build towers. Sometimes to make paper airplanes, but there's seating chart and activity. They have to talk to each other uh, and it, it helps tremendously. The, the, the pushback on that, and this is like us, me feeling this way too, and, and Brewster is like, it's the amount of time you feel like you're giving up. Like you get really nervous, like, oh my God, we're using up so much time when we should be, you know, doing instruction, kids, you know, engaging in projects. Um, but what we found is that the time that you save on the other side of that relation, those relationships being formed is monumental. Um, we don't have any, I mean, yeah, we have the normal stuff. I can't sit with so-and-so today because of blah, blah, blah. Uh, but um, you, the amount of time it takes to get kids on task, to move into a project, to go to their spot, to do all those things, it becomes automatic um, and they don't, you know, you, you don't get the pushback because they feel safe. Um, and we make, <laughs> they have to continually verbalize that. Like, you know, why are we doing this? Because you can't learn unless you feel safe. And, um, you know, we're trying to build a community in the classroom and people feel safe when they're in a community with people that they know and they like. Um, and that's over and over and over again. So, this so is Frank, great. I just have to jump in. So can you characterize what the dynamics are of your student PBL teams once they get, once you've gone through this, um, do, do they, for example, settle down much quicker when they're working together? Do they uh, more easily uh, brainstorm? Uh, do, does the kid who traditionally would say, I'm in charge here and I'm going to tell you others what to do, do those kids, do, does that tendency recede. What's the dynamics of kids doing PBL together once you've made them feel safe with each other? So that, that brings us to our third point. Um, one of the things that we've been doing for years um, and really incorporating it is doing stuff around kids doing a Myers-Briggs or a Big Five personality uh, inventory, uh, understanding their, their strengths, their weaknesses, um, how they interact with people, you know, whether I'm an introvert or an extrovert, for, for instance, and what that means in a group. Uh, and they get, they start using that actual language. Um, they have little tools that say, you know, um, I'm an introvert. I help the group by, you know, listening carefully to directions, uh, trying to understand what's going on. I hurt the group by not speaking up. I need to be reminded to uh, talk. Um, and those types of things, uh, you know, those are the things that go a long ways towards the group functioning better. Um, 
you, you know, kids start to know each other. They actually talk to each other in the language. We're like, oh, we know, you know, for example, we have a student and we know you're very quiet and, but we also know you're really smart and we need to know what you think. I mean, and that's oversimplified conversation, but that's what starts to happen when kids start to understand the way their brain works, the way other kid, kids' brains work, and they lose that kind of, that really egocentric view. Yeah, of every, everything gets, Frank, to answer, like everything gets, gets softened. Like the, the extreme extroverts get softened a little bit, the extreme introverts get softened a little bit. The kids who like try to completely take over, get, yeah, that gets softened a little bit. But I think, I mean, for, for us, we have, we have had great years for the last seven straight years in doing this. We have ceased to have a bad year. Like it just doesn't happen anymore. I mean, it's, it's really phenomenal. We had one back epically bad year and that this all came as a result of it. Right. So I guess that was a good thing. Right. <laughs> um, it I wanna, it I was a tremendous thing. Sensitive to the time. And um, I know Ella's work also overlaps with SEL too. So let's make sure since we only have about seven more minutes um, uh, make sure that we wrap other ideas in there too. So I, I, I assume that that was the main thing that you wanted to talk about was, Hey, these are the things that we're doing. And my takeaway is that if that allows kids to then sharpen their attention to the challenging work that you're putting in front of them, you've gained all kinds of time that you, would have lost in little dribs and drabs of uh, trying to negotiate um, relationships between kids. Uh, so it's good foundational work to help make the other work uh, more, mm -hmm. more meaningful. Yeah. Hey, I, I got to ask Ella a question. So to pull you into this conversation, Ella, you were outlining uh, some learning situations where students were actually working with adults in older adults. Have you, so, so taking this question about feeling safe, can you extend, give us a quick response to adults feeling safe with students, um, students feeling safe with adults? I mean, uh, my, my understanding is there's a lot of older citizens who are afraid of teenagers. Um, can, you, can you extend Brewster and Pete's uh, observations to, to your work? Muted. Oh, muted, uh, Nick. There we go. Yep. Yeah, I think I can build on maybe quickly on both um, Nick and your questions uh, around uh, social and the relationship, you know, between um, adults and kids. I am visual, so I talk with pictures. <laughs> so if I can share again, um, you know, I think on the topic of adults and kids. Um, I got it. Um, you know, like some of the other examples I had are like kids designing for like caterpillars that are stuck, can't cross the street. Like some of those things are so obvious, right? Like kids just, you know, you know, the empathy or for their favorite book character are so obvious. Um, not all kids immediately go, oh yeah, I want to work with an older adult and vice versa. And oh my gosh, when you put them together, like if you, um, we just launched the, the site for engineering for humanity, that class. So um, you can see the videos there, but um, kids of all ages, this is, uh, this is younger kids that are doing also design with the elderly. Um, it is so life-changing for them and the older adults. There's as many quotes from them as there are from the kids about how they haven't interacted with young people in so long. And it was intriguing to see how they think and they learn to think differently for themselves. Um, so, and honestly, that, that's a very challenging class to teach. There's a lot to it. And that outcome is the reason, the transformation on both sides is the reason Katrin and I both come back to teach it. Um, and on the point of it being challenging, you know, all project-based learning is, I really want to build, you know, on you guys before me is really challenging and in an authentic way, right? Those are the interpersonal challenges they will face when they leave. Um, I've led teams for 13 years at IDEO. So uh, it's super real. And so um, as a quick build, you know, also in K-12, whether they're working for older adults or like Wijing described creating, um, you know, things for younger kids, educational games for younger kids, we see <laughs> trial and error, that's what this is, but also um, teachers using Innovators Compass or whatever, right, to help ki that kids 
get unstuck um, with their team dynamics or, or their project, those are really interrelated, right? Team is stuck, project is stuck. Um, and so uh, this is Taryn um, and, and broader just social emotional learning issues. Playgrounds come up a lot. There are so many <laughs> people using Innovators Compass on playgrounds. Um, this is Megan uh, in Syracuse. You know, you can already tell kind of what this one is about. And I got to watch one in action here in Boston. You know, kids sort of sharing some of the same kinds of self-aware, you know, kind of feelings that you were describing, you know, in your circle, right? Like, hey, they're not playing my game or I'm feeling really excluded. Um, sharing their observations about what's happening, sharing their principles about what matters most to them, being safe, that word came up too. Um, these were scribed by the teacher, but these are their words. Free choice, that people listen to each other. A lot of the same values and principles came up. Coming up with ideas, you know, implementing their ideas, no blocking the slide, uh, iterating their ideas when that sign didn't work. <laughs> Let's add a picture and see if that helps. Um, and just dealing, you know, everything is going to exacerbate it. The kinds of things like we have now when current events come up, you know, you can't just, talk, someone mentioned going slow to go fast, you can't power through. You have to pause. And um, Valeria in Miami gave her kids individual and group time to process Hurricane Irma when that, they all had to evacuate and came back to school. Sound familiar? Mm -hmm. um, and Erin Quinn's uh, classroom in, in, in Canada, they, they didn't have a permanent classroom for a year the better part of a year. Does that sound familiar? And so they had to, they worked on how to create classroom culture um, with the lack of, they couldn't really do anything to the space. So what could they do that, um, that fostered their culture when they were right. you know, nice. migrants? So those are the kinds of yeah. nice. groups. This is Frank, I got to so, like, yeah. dip in for one minute. So yeah. you're, a, big, big, a big takeaway I just got was stuck and unstuck. And, and yep. Every, every project gets stuck somehow, often out of lack of knowing how to, how to ideate other possibilities. So Pete and Brewster, do you find that when you spend that foundation time uh, getting kids to be safe with each other, are they better to, to keep themselves out of being stuck? What's the dynamics? Yeah. Well, they're just, I mean, they, when they, they are so much more likely to like each other and be comfortable that you don't get the same types of stuck that you get before. Mm -hmm. I mean, before kids got stuck because they just didn't like each other, like for whatever reason, because back in seventh grade, something happened or, you know, whatever, some stupid reason, Th those things disappear, um, especially because of circles, because they get to hear their classmates say things and say what they think and they start to realize that these are other human beings and not just kids who um pete's muted again um so it it, hel it helps tremendously it, it avoids getting stuck in the first place on the stupid stuff they'll still get stuck on legitimate re for legitimate reasons uh, i'll give you stuck as they yeah i'll give you one great example it was probably only about a month into the school year um and it was a new seating chart and we, we are heterogeneously grouped. Um, we have special ed with, you know, one-on-ones or, you know, a special ed teacher in the room, all the way to kids who are honors all in the same room, all share, you know, put, being put together in groups. And we had a student that was being, saying stuff kind of sarcastically to this student who's autistic, uh, very bright, but, you know, been bullied her whole life. Um, and two of the other students at the table took him to task about what he was saying. And in fact, like we're very upset, came up, told us, made him, told him that he needed to apologize. He apologized. So we would learned about this stuff after the fact and we talked to him and he felt horrible about the situation. And he didn't realize that she'd been bullied all this time. And when the kids called him out on it and that was, we didn't, that took zero time, which was a bullying situation. I made one phone call home to the parent, told him what happened you know, that the kids stepped up, they did something with it, that they, did they want to do any more follow up with it through admin or anything like that. And the parent said, you know, I, I let the, the building principal know, the parent was fine with it. They said, thank you. She loves the class. She felt really good. The kids were sticking up for her. That could have been, that could have been hours of my day. And you know what, Pete? Having a student intervene is probably more powerful than having a teacher intervene. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. Because he had to own up to what he did to kids. Uh, and we've never had a problem with that again with that student. I mean, so and that was, that's... We're, um, that, that you can tell if I'm on video, that must mean that we're out of time here. Um, <laughs> And it just to really quickly recap what Frank started this whole thing with, which is we expect to repeat this in October. We expect to see all kinds of interesting new conversations that emerge out of this. And, um, and more importantly, not just doing it again in October is that if you are legitimately inspired and desiring to connect to some of the people that have been sharing, please do, because that will mean that you begin to engage in new practice now rather than some other time in the future. Um, I want, just because I'm seeing a lot of familiar names coming in who might be a little bit confused um, about where we are. And I, I'm just gonna share my screen real quick and remind everybody of um, where we are in this 24 hour <laughs> torment. Uh, and so we're about to have, um, uh, conversation about learning expeditions. That's the next thing here, Stephen and Amaris. And then um, the next one is a collection of watershed projects in Montana and uh, Columbia. Then we'll have a conversation um, at uh, Dalton um, in um, Beijing, uh, complemented by uh, Joel Grimm at Beaverworks. And then a collection of folks from the Midwest, Alan, Camille, um, uh, Melanie and Bill. And then at uh, 1900 GMT, which is um, noon in Missoula, Montana, um, <laughs> some friends of mine will uh, be coming on, Kathleen and Allie. And then following that, uh, a wonderful project going on down in Costa Rica that um, Juan Carlos will share, along with Liz, uh, taking her own Idaho flavor of things. And then we move in late in the day and you, none of you are on the call yet. So I'm not gonna, oh no, Lisa's on the call. Uh, Kirsch is on the call from Brightways, but you're not on until um, 4 p.m. In, Mon in Montana, just so you remember. <laughs> oh, Nick, uh, 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 g g g thanks for that outline. And, and Gabrielle's on the, uh, on, the, um, uh, uh, on the web here. Um, we have those cute little videos that outline what's happening in four hour blocks. Are we able yep. to show those? I don't have the ability to show them. Um, uh, Gabrielle have the ability to show them? Not in this moment. And we'll take a pause because we're already running into the next segment. So. Right. I know. Right. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much for jumping yeah. into this uh, crazy day for us. And you all have so much more to say than we could compress into that hour. Um, and we hope to um, get you back. So. Yeah. And not to, not to, not to forget who I too. So thanks for kicking this discussion yeah. off at, Elliot, we, right. it was great to see you. All right, thank you. I'm gonna um, try to set up, oh, and actually it's easy to find the next people because I can see them. <laughs> All right, thank you again. Bye-bye, thank you so much.